Now that we've examined different methods for computing the energies of excited states, and in some instances their actual wave functions, let's talk about the manifold of states ranging from ground through excited states and the possible dynamics of systems as they evolve on different potential energy surfaces. And let's begin by uh, discussing avoided crossings and conical intersections. And so if you think of the secular equation for a two by two determinant, so I'll have two states and I have two energies that I need to find. The energies are given by a simple quadratic equation. And we can ask the state, the, the question, could the two states have the same energy? That is, they would be degenerate. So in this instance, that's going to require uh, two things to be true, namely that H11 and H22 are the same, and also that the off-diagonal matrix element, H12, which is equal to H21 by symmetry, is equal to zero. So that requirement involves two degrees of freedom. And a diatomic molecule only has one degree of freedom, its bond length. And this leads to what's known as the avoided crossing rule. That is, you cannot have two electronic states have the same energy, or another way to view it would be in potential energy surfaces for a diatomic, no two potential energy surfaces touch. However, if you have a larger molecule with more than a single degree of freedom, it certainly is possible for two electronic states, or more than two for that matter, to be degenerate. And where that happens, that gives rise in the potential energy surfaces to what's known as a conical intersection. And so let's just take a picture at that, uh, uh, take a look at a picture of that. So here, for the molecule NO2, is shown uh, two potential energy surfaces. All right, and so one surface, which is shown down here, at a certain bond angle, so you'll notice this is being plotted as a function of two degrees of freedom, a bond length, the NO bond length, treated symmetrically, and the bond angle, so the ONO angle. And this is uh, taken from some work of uh, Carlo Petrongolo. So if you imagine that you have a system sitting on the ground state, and this could be a vibrational wave packet, it's sampling uh, certain bend angles, and you excite it, so it absorbs a photon and it jumps up to this excited state. It then rolls downhill because the excited state has a equilibrium bond angle that is less bent, so, uh, excuse me, it's more bent, so uh, a smaller angle. And at a certain point, the ground state energy, which goes up with angle bending, compared to the excited state energy, which goes down with angle bending, they cross. And the crossing is not simply a point, but it's a seam, so we would be able to find a line where these two surfaces intersect one another. And at that stage, uh, the wave packet can do various things dynamically. It can continue back up on this surface. It can actually <coughs> continue along on this surface. At some point, it may emit a photon and uh, go, go down in energy. So had it gone up here, it might fall to this surface. There are many things that can happen. So if we project into a single dimension, uh, a single geometric dimension that is, that makes it look more as though there is indeed an intersection of two cones at a point. And so in this particular system, I have a, a curve I've labeled S1 and one I've labeled S2. And we don't need to worry about whether one of these is ground or they're both excited. In any case, they're just these two curves. They cross at a certain point. And conical intersections permit radiationless transitions from one state to another. And so if we take S0 to be the ground state, so that might be somewhere quite far down here, uh, there is a rule called Kasha's rule that says that the internal conversions among excited states will be very fast until you reach S1, which is the first state above the ground state. And the reason Kasha's rule generally applies is that there tend to be many excited states close to one another, all significantly above the ground state, so the opportunities to cross to the ground state surface are, are considerably reduced. But just to focus on some of the processes that are sort of illustrated here, one might envision that you're sitting in this S2 well when a photon is, absor is absorbed, you go up onto this S1 surface, 
At that stage, you can go left, you can go right. If you were to go right, you might fall into this well, from which you could decay into a highly vibrationally excited state, for instance, of this other electronic state, and fall down into this minimum or this minimum, or maybe you just kept going, you fell into another well, you emit a photon in order to transition from one state to another. So radiationless transition, energy of course has to be conserved. So since you've lost energy in the electronic state, it must have found its way into vibrations or rotations, and uh, that can happen when the states are very close to one another. In addition, over on this left-hand side, there is a true conical intersection, so there's a seam and other degrees of freedom. But in any case, you can propagate either along the red path or the blue path. It just depends on how you come through that intersection. So the probability of crossing from one surface to another, one simple model that measures that probability is known as the Landau-Zener model. And so the Landau-Zener model says that the probability is the exponential minus pi v12 squared, so that's sometimes called the coupling matrix element, divided by hv psi1 dot minus psi2 dot. And so v is a velocity term, and these uh, psi1 dot and psi2 dots, that is the derivative of the energy with respect to the coordinate on a given state surface. And that's most easily seen looking at this uh, this plot of this expanded region where these two curves come close to one another. And so what is the derivative? Of course, it's just the slope. And so if we were to plot the slope as the curves are coming towards one another in two different directions, so here's the u1 and here's the u2, and v12 is the energy separation between them. So what you see is if you analyze this and you ask, oh, well, when will probability be maximized? So you'd really like this e to the minus something to be e to the minus zero, then the probability would be one. And so how can we make the argument of this exponential zero? And so one way, of course, is to have v12 be zero. So as the curves touch one another within the Landau-Zener model, you would get 100% probability of crossing. It's not actually meant to be applied for when they touch one another. It's meant for coming close to one another. But bottom line is, the closer they get, the more likely you are. In addition, the velocity, so that's the velocity with which a wave packet is propagating on one surface. As the velocity becomes very, very large, there is a tendency for this to go to zero. And a way to think about that is that you're moving with some sort of uh, trajectory, in a sense. As I fall down this slope, I'm headed in a direction dictated by that derivative. And just simple momentum, I'd inertia, if you will, I'd like to keep going in that direction. But meanwhile, this other curve is going up. And so high velocity, I tend to keep going in the same direction, and I would do a crossing. Uh, in addition, of course, if either of these two derivatives becomes infinite, that also would cause the denominator to go infinite, and the uh, argument goes to zero, and the probability becomes high. And so that sort of says if you're falling straight downhill, you'll have a tendency to just keep going blasting straight downhill. Now, what about the case where two electronic states would have different spin multiplicity. So in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and what that means when we say non-relativistic, we, we sort of add spin on as a post hoc treatment. We Most of all the theories we've discussed, Hartree-Fock theory, post Hartree-Fock theories, and so forth, really spin is kind of an afterthought. Uh, but in any case, within the non-relativistic quantum mechanics, transitions between two states of different spin multiplicity those are strictly forbidden. In, in, in fact, it's, uh, uh, that's what the parentheses say. It's a little paradoxical to even talk about spin when you're thinking about non-relativistic quantum mechanics because it turns out that spin derives as a quantum number from the relativistic treatment of the electron. So when, you, when Dirac solved for a relativistic electron, out came spin. So the relativistic Hamiltonian includes other operators beyond the ones we're used to. So we're used to attraction of electrons to nuclei, repulsion of electrons from each other, kinetic energy of electrons. However, the relativistic Hamiltonian includes things like a spin-orbit coupling operator. So that is the angular momentum of the spin and the angular momentum of a particular orbital can couple. The spin-spin dipole operator that couples two electrons and a hyperfine operator that couples electronic and nuclear spins. So all of those lead to wave functions 
that can be thought of as superpositions, uh, just as a CI wave function is a linear combination of different uh, uh, configurations, so too a relativistic wave function can be thought of as a combination of different spin states, where the electron spin and the, uh, say, orbital angular momentum must all be some common quantum number, but you can mix and match them in certain ways. And as a result, you can collapse, if you like, into different spin states. So in any case, that spin-orbit coupling operator, which is shown here, so here is an electronic spin, here's an orbital angular momentum, that allows a crossing from one state to another, and the coupling increases with the fourth power of the atomic number. And so what you see here, by the way, is that it's divided by 1 over c squared. So 1 over c squared, that's the speed of light squared. So that's a very big number. And that's why we need a, a very large uh, value of z that is heavy nuclei do this. And that's known as the heavy atom effect. You can uh, cause spin states to, uh, to do inter-system crossing, which we'll see in a moment, when we have heavy atoms around. So this is a Jablonski diagram, which kind of summarizes in one convenient diagram many of the physical processes I've just discussed. And so uh, on the Jablonski diagram, we have a ground electronic state with varying vibrational states uh, indexed here. Here's a first excited state singlet and a second excited state singlet. And here's a first excited state triplet. So that'll differ from the singlet by a spin flip. The various things that can happen, these green up arrows, those are excitations or absorptions, and they occur on a time scale of electronic motion, and that's about 10 to the minus 15th seconds. Internal conversion, that's this relaxation down from excited electronic states as well as excited vibrational states down to the lowest vibrational state of uh, S1, that's also very fast, 10 to the minus 14th to 10 to the minus 11th seconds. And incidentally, of course, there are many different vibrational quanta. So shown here is, say, a, a relaxation to the zeroth uh, vibrational level. But, of course, energy is conserved. So if you're dropping uh, vibrational quanta here, you are perhaps putting them into other vibrational quanta or into rotations. In any case, uh, that is internal conversion. And that occurs on time scales of 10 to the minus 14th to 10 to the minus 11th seconds. You can emit a photon and go back down to the ground state. That's fluorescence, and it has this characteristic time scale. Alternatively, you can inter-system cross. That is, go from a singlet state to a triplet state. The triplet is lower in energy. Once you are in the triplet state, you can uh, go back to the singlet state. That would need to be thermally activated because you're going uphill. You can non-radiatively relax if you're close enough to the ground state. So again, you'd have to couple with other uh, quanta, maybe vibrational or rotational or what have you. And you can also emit a photon. That is a very slow process because it's, it's formally forbidden, the triplet going to the singlet state. That's known as phosphorescence. And so, of course, there are many minerals that are beautifully phosphorescent. If you shine a UV light on them and then turn the UV lamp off, they continue to glow for a while, and that's because they are phosphorescing. They're emitting photons while changing spin states. Uh, there is uh, also indicated on here quenching and non-radiative relaxation, and so quenching might be perhaps giving up energy to another partner in a condensed phase medium, non-radiative relaxation we've already discussed. So the Jablonski diagram tries to put all that into sort of one common framework, and left out of this framework, though, is sort of geometric relaxation that may take place subsequent to uh, absorption of a photon. So adding dynamics further complicates this picture. If you think it's complicated now, uh, what, what complicates it further is thinking about how the geometry of the molecule evolves as it goes through these various electronic states. And then there's also the influence of salvation. And we'll talk about salvation actually in the next video, so I won't dwell on it here. So here is, uh, if this is a slide that looks imposing and impenetrable and uh, difficult to follow, well, that's because excited state dynamics are sort of imposing and difficult to imagine. So the issue here is we've got this molecule. So this is a uh, azobenzene species. 
Technically, technically it's not azobenzene because there's a benzene here, and this is actually a cyclohexene, not a benzene. But what will happen when it absorbs a photon is that the molecule can go from E to Z, for example. This is a double bond, and it can have two stereochemistries. And the, ma the manner in which it can accomplish that is it can rotate about the bond, it can actually invert through a nitrogen atom, and that will be controlled by the torsion angle as well as the bending angle. And so this particular paper of Garavelli and co-workers in 2007 in JAX attempted really to project as much of the dynamical behavior as possible into a single uh, figure. And of course it's difficult to do that, but just to sort of give a rough feel, you would start down here at the minimum energy geometry of the ground state S0. And at that stage it can absorb a photon and they are showing sort of open uh, uh, characters, figures, sunburst, whatever we should call that, as well as dark ones. And that's a measure of is it a so-called bright state or a dark state, which is simply to say is the is the oscillator strength strong enough to expect an absorption or no? And in fact, what they see is they can excite directly to S1, or they can excite up here to S3, or to S5. Those are all filled uh, 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 characters, I guess I'll keep calling them. And then as they evolve on their respective surfaces, they can cross. So here's a little wave packet. All the time that they're moving, they're moving in other directions. This says planar relaxation, this says torsion. So this is an attempt to project different motions of the molecule on some sort of common axis and really show where they're crossing and where they might change. And way out here, there's a conical intersection. That's what CI is along the torsion, which would allow you to get back to the ground state, which is rising as you go along this torsional coordinate. And so I, I, let's not dwell too much more on this. This is all sorts of uh, geometric details for specific points along here. And you'd have to read the whole paper to actually see what all these different structures are. But this next uh, diagram is simply to try to focus on two of the geometric degrees of freedom and illustrate one of those sets of arrows. It was the red arrows on S2 on the last curve. And here we have the torsional coordinate. So if you like, this is the coordinate that is rotating one ring about this bond relative to the other ring. And then meanwhile, orthogonal is the bending coordinate. So this is the CNNC uh, linkage either becoming nearly linear in this direction or taking on increasingly acute angles in this direction. And the idea is simply to show that the, the real trajectory, even though one is sort of following arrows along a torsional motion, is actually vibrating in the bending motion as well. And so that's what these little dotted lines are. And each time it hits sort of the furthest amplitude of a bend, that's actually where there's a seam between S2 and S1. So with every vi vibration, you would expect to see some of the wave, some probability that the wave packet will drop down onto the S1 surface and there would actually be a crossing as opposed to continuing along the S2. All right, so uh, just an indication that these conical intersections, these seams associated with conical intersections, they're really everywhere in complicated molecules. And you certainly can uh, very rapidly go down to lower energy electronic state surfaces. And this is just a final uh, picture uh, to look at what's going on here. Again, trying to project into different uh, uh, degrees of freedom. So here's a torsion, and here's a torsion, and here we have uh, uh, the torsional angles being shown. So if the torsional angle is near zero, that corresponds to the Z minimum. So here we have it, the Z minimum on the ground state surface. Here's the E minimum, and not surprisingly, the E is lower in energy than the Z. And so if you ask about the quantum yield of photoisomerization, so I start with a solution of E, and I pump photons into it. And I ask, after a certain amount of time, how much Z will I have made? How do you make Z? Well, if you give it enough photons, uh, photons of a particular energy that only go to the end of pi star state, then it will hit that uh, surface, it propagates, it comes to a conical intersection, and it can uh, go through the intersection and either fall down this surface or fall down this surface. And these wavy arrows are giving you an idea about the weights that were computed in this particular study. If you give it more energy, of course, you can propagate up onto higher surfaces. And so here's this S2, S1 seam we were looking at. 
Turns out once you're on S1, you can find a seam down to S0, and that drains some of the uh, reactivity. So you get less quantum yield, which is to say it takes more photons to generate Z species because some of the things you're exciting are draining more efficiently back to E, and that is uh, all you're doing is putting heat into the system at that stage as opposed to actually getting desired reactivity. All right, well, so dynamics, uh, photochemistry in general, is actually terrifically complicated. So if, if that seemed a little confusing, you're not alone. It's confusing to everybody who looks at photochemistry. But it's sort of the take-home message is that these conical intersections, which are everywhere between excited states, really uh, play a decisive role in determining how systems evolve and how they geometrically relax as they come back to the ground electronic state. So we'll stop there. Uh, in the next video, we'll take a final look at what happens when we couple all these already reasonably complex uh, phenomena with solvation and the influence of a surrounding medium.